Um, so I'll, I'll, yep, so we're going to kick off. Um, so I should say welcome to our, what's it now, fourth um, session that we've had of uh, an annual gathering for SRITC. For those of you that haven't joined us before, we had an in-person one in 2018 in Inverness, 2019 with Carnoose Day, last year was online, this year's online, and next year it is going to be in person, but for those that are overseas, we will make sure it's hybrid and that you can still join us. And we're going to give you a poll later on today to make a decision on where the location will be. So it will be up to you guys, not up to us. So for those of you that have never been with us, I'm Jenny Milne. I founded SRITC back at the end of 2017, 2018. And it's all about bringing like-minded people together, not just in Scotland, the UK, but further afield to discuss things all rural mobility. So um, let's kick off. I want to give you a bit of a quick rundown. Now, being a dyslexic person, these are the only PowerPoints that you're going to get, I promise, all afternoon. But I need a bit of a prompter, OK? Now, we have had huge success this year. It's been phenomenal, OK? We've had the Scottish Rural Parliament, and we'll hear more of that later on shortly with Artemis. And we published a report from that. Alistair Dalton, I think, is here. And we had an article on the Scotsman from one of the cafes that we run, which are monthly, uh, talking about Alva, the island of Alva, which we'll come back to in discussions later on again. Um, the big moment for me was I always dreamed of getting SRITC established as a social enterprise. And we are now established as of June as a community interest company, which is fantastic. But it's causing grey hairs for me because the amount of paperwork, registration with HMRC, bank accounts, all the rest of it that goes on in the background is really quite extensive. But it's a great, great opportunity. The big news that nobody will know about, or maybe a handful of you will know about is we've actually got some funding. We found out on Friday that we have been very successful in getting some funding through Smarter Choices, Smarter Places, and I'm really pleased to hear that they're attending today. Uh, more of this will come out over this afternoon, but also in due course. And as a result of that, we are going to be recruiting um, for some positions. So if you're interested in a paid position on a four or five hour um, basis per week, one person to work alongside me, helping out behind the scenes with some admin and organization project management, or if you want to get involved in the marketing and social media, then um, Alex will be your man. Again, very small scale, but every little helps and it is paid positions. So a big thanks to Smarter Choices, Smarter Places and more of that to come. Another thing you won't know about, um, I've got the short straw, I think. Um, on Wednesday next week, Alex and I are going to the Scottish Parliament and we are delivering on the session for Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee. Um, it will be live, you can all join in. Um, we will come back to this. Um, I know Alex is busy putting up polls, etc., but we'll come back to this. We need evidence to be able to put forward next week at the Scottish Parliament. It's a fantastic opportunity for SRITC. And uh, anybody from an island or anybody who's got connections with Ireland or anybody that lives in a rural area that accesses the, the islands, we need to hear from you. So please put down your positives, your negatives, everything into the chat box because that really is uh, important and we will be live on wednesday and you can come and join us um, and you can see what we're saying from what you've put across to us so fantastic opportunity lots is happening it's a bit like buses one comes all of them come and um, we obviously have our october cafe coming up and that's a a uh, free-for-all open session where we will talk about anything and everything so alex will again share some of the links uh, for that one and in november um, to finish off the year i've decided to make this a cafe that you decide who do you want to speak what subject do you matter do you want to talk about is there somebody out there that wants to come and um, present for 10 15 minutes to the community um, and it's your open cafe so again that chat box i said to you it's my friend it's your friend if you can put down suggestions of themes that you'd like or people that you would like to hear from even different countries because obviously we're well attended today from italy japan um, as i said nordic states and parts of europe and obviously america so november is your cafe um, we're also in the background starting to pull together, as you've seen, for some emails, a rural engagement platform. It's at seed stage at the moment, um, but again, uh, I thank you to those who participated in the survey that we had out 
And this is an idea of being able to pull together a lot of what's happening in rural transport and mobility, not just in Scotland, but elsewhere, that we can bring together everybody um, from the bottom up and make sure that we're sharing the information. Because the classical problem is lots happens, but it's so siloed and disjointed that we don't get to learn from each other and we want to sort that out. And then that moves us into 2022 and we will have the cafes running as usual online so that you can either dial into them or see them. And we will be running the gathering, as I said, in uh, 2022. And one of the polls that Alex is going to put up um, will be about location. We have narrowed it down to two locations based on the information we had for this year. And we want to decide where we're going to go so we can book something. And I can have a gin with a number of you in a place and just chill. So that's the plan for the gathering for next year. And all of this has been done in volunteer time. None of us get paid for SRITC. And um, so I have to do a really big thanks to all those people that help out behind the scenes. You know who you are. I'm not going to embarrass you by getting you to wave or stand in a box or stand in a room, whatever. But I really do appreciate it. And I really do also appreciate the support that we've had financially from our core um, supporters, because a lot of this wouldn't have happened without them there. So, as I said, key partners going forward, we have smarter choices, smarter places, um, and that's for the next rolling year. I also have John Yellowlees with us today, who's also been on some of the cafes, the Chartered, of, Chartered, Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, CILT, um, have kindly um, supported SRITC, um, and it's great to have them on board. I'm slightly biased, I'm on the committee with John on this, but great organisation. Um, so if you're involved in transport, no matter where you are, please do look them up. I've got Simon here from 42, who you've probably um, seen before um, at some cafes. They've, uh, they're continuing their support uh, with SRITC next year, as is Matt from the routing company. So again, I think you might have seen him at a cafe. If you haven't seen him at a cafe, both of them did cafes as a, a privileged position. Um, back earlier in the year, you can go and download their information. So that's, that's a big thanks to the supporters out there. Nearly there with the PowerPoints, promise. Um, I can't remember all of this without a PowerPoint in front of me. Um, Artemis and I are about to have a, a chat and then I'm going to be handing over to discuss mobility hubs. And if you want to go for a walk and take us for a walk, you can do. We'll talk about mobility hubs and community hubs. Then we're going to have a sneaky break and I'm going to get you doing some running around the house to, or the office um, or outside. And then we're going to be going to the Netherlands and Sweden to be hearing about projects for rural mass. As some of you know, I do a part time PhD and uh, it's on rural mobility as a service. And these two guys got the short straw being interviewed by me uh, earlier in the year. So um, I want them to share their stories. I think you'll find it really interesting. Um, then we're going to have a quick break again and then we're going to come back and the Scottish Mobility Cluster uh, are going to be talking about decarbonation, decarbonisation and rural. So that big nut to, to crack, particularly when we've got COP26 on the horizon. Then we're going to have a session about um, showcasing for communities. And this is your opportunity to have a think just now. Are you a community, an organisation, a company that has a problem that you want to solve? And please, not about funding. I haven't got that magic wand yet, OK? But if you need a partner or you need to solve a problem, or I'm going to pick on Liz here, you're somebody that hasn't got um, access to transport and you want to solve a problem, this is the 15 minutes of somebody can say for one minute, this is the problem, how can we sort it out? And see if we can crack the nut between us. Then I'm going to hand over to uh, Rachel and Suzanne, who are going to be the rugrats to retirees. So we're talking about accessible transport and active travel. And then I will come together and I will talk to you about the social workshop, which some of you will be going to, some of you aren't. Um, I know many of you have got concerns about travelling at the moment because of the shortage in the UK of um, petrol and diesel, but there are a few keen beans that want to meet up with like-minded people. So um, that's where we're at. That was a whiz-bang tour, I hope. Um, Alex can keep going with the, the polls in the background. But in the short term, for the next five minutes, I'm going to speak to Artemis. Artemis, where are you? I can't see you on my big screen. Do you want to I'm come here, up? Hey, and I'm also hello. on the Isle of Rassi. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Jenny, for inviting me to the gathering. Fantastic. Now, some of you may have seen Artemis uh, earlier in the year, um, but I'm going to ask her to introduce herself and introduce the organisation that she represents. So, Artemis. So I'm National Coordinator for Scottish Rural Action, um, and we are like the Rural and Island Transport Community, an alliance of people and organisations, a community of communities, 
Our remit is broader than just transport. We look at all areas of rural and island life. And rural and island Scotland is huge. It's very complex, it's very diverse. And our job is to bring that diversity to, to decision makers and co-produce policy. And the way we do that is through building platforms like the Scottish Rural Parliament that Jenny mentioned. And the Rural Parliament is a democratic assembly. It brings together rural and island communities to debate what needs to happen in terms of furthering rural and island development. And then we present recommendations to government. The last rural parliament, it took place in March 2021. It was the first online rural parliament in the world, which was really nail biting. Um, and each session of the rural parliament, whether it looks at democracy or social care or um, equalities, is curated by a different expert organization. And we were very lucky that SRITC curated the transport session. And it feels like there's this golden thread that connects the rural parliament and the voice that that has with the gathering and the voice that you have today. Yeah, it does. And SRA are very much supporters and friends of SRITC. And also Artemis has the same short straw as us. She's coming to Parliament on Wednesday as well. So uh, yes, we're, we're both we're both rather nervous about it, aren't we? Um, very nervous. Going, going back to the rural parliament, um, what do you think were the key messages that came out around transport at that session? Well, I'm actually really excited about this because I feel the main messages that came out about transport from the rural parliament are being put into practice in the gathering today. So the rural parliament came up with things that are needed to further the rural and island transport agenda in Scotland. And the gathering is all about saying, and here's how we do this. Here are the solutions. Here's the innovation. Here's how we put that in practice. The main message that came out of the Scottish rural parliament was very much that you need to look at transport in the context of mobility the right that people have to access the things that they need and the services they need and the and to do this as close to them as possible and the environmental benefits of that. The two tenets of mobility, which are transport and digital connectivity, are the two areas of rural and island life where market failure is most universally felt, whether you're a business in Socky and Clack Manager or living up in Shetland, like a couple of our delegates are here today. So what, what has happened, and this was discussed a lot of the rural parliament over the last years, is that micro enterprises, small enterprises, communities in rural and island Scotland have developed thousands of micro solutions, micro innovations to address transport issues. And these solutions are tailored to the people in the places. And these solutions are also importantly very resilient and COVID has proven this. And that resilience is going to stand us in good stead as we look forward towards climate change and the impact of, of Brexit and things like that. And so think, the main message from the rural parliament was very much that transport policy needs to be flexible in order to support and invest in micro solutions in rural and island areas. And I know you said this to me many times, but that's why I like SRITC, because we gather together the micro and we're able to present it, which is why for us, like you, getting that evidence together for Wednesday from those attending is really important, particularly because that policy context can only be, I'm going to say, influenced in inverted commas or informed by what we put forward. So what do you think the, the, this all means for policy in Scotland at the moment? I think we have, um, we have cause to be optimistic to be honest, in terms of policy, we have the National Transport Strategy 2, um, which is Scotland's national transport strategy, is now moving into an implementation phase. There are rumblings that there will be uh, a rural and island group which will oversee that particular aspect of implementation, which is a recommendation coming out of the rural parliament. We also have the National Strategy for Economic Transformation, and that's an opportunity to really integrate mobility with regional economic development, We've got climate change with, with very ambitious you know, targets and legislation following that. So we have three areas of Scottish policy making which have an ambitious agenda and people are going to be looking around for solutions as to how to further that agenda. Everybody here at the gathering should be saying, look no further, you know, come to us, come to us for those solutions. And what makes me even more optimistic is looking globally, the past two years has seen um, other institutions and other countries really kind of stepping forward with a rural first or an island first policy making agenda. And that is basically looking to rural for the solutions, not trying to apply national solutions to rural. 
Um, so amongst the institutions and countries that are doing that, we've got neighboring European Commission, we've got Northern Ireland, we've got the Republic of Ireland. And I think Scotland will be feeling that international pressure to pull its own socks up. And for that reason, I'm really, really delighted that today we have so many people from the international community joining the gathering because it is literally we can learn from you and, and working together will help us on our journey. And I just realized that's a pun and I'm really sorry. <laughs> no, it was a good one. I have to say, I think well, on my journey with my PhD with all the uh, international and um, just yesterday um, on one of the conferences, it was really interesting to hear that the rural mobility is on the agenda and um, people look to Scotland because they see Scotland as being rural, but equally we need to look elsewhere. So I can't see the chat at the moment, but I'm sure my international counterparts that are out there will be filling us with information and suggestions and shared experiences and shared policies. One thing I think I want to take away is that we really need to get a rural um, management plan. We have uh, sustainable urban management plans. We need a rural one. And we obviously looked mm -hmm. at that last year um, at, at the, the online gathering that we did. So um, I'm going to thank you, Artemis, for your time. It's really appreciated. Um, as I say, you can see all of us on Wednesday at the Scottish Government looking very scared and probably with a glass of wine in front of us at that early morning. For those of you that haven't read it, the Scottish Rural Parliament report that was written on transport um, is available on our website. I think it will go into the chat as well. But I'm sure if Artemis has got links that she wants to share on the subject, she'll, she'll put it into the, the box as well. So thank you, Artemis. Right, deep breath. We're now moving on to the next section. And I'm going to ask uh, the following people to put their cameras on and to take themselves off mute. Stephen, are you there? Duncan, are you there? Julie, are you there? And Jody, are you there? Please say yes, because I've got too many pictures to see. Yes, yes. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Right. If you want to go and do the ironing or you want to go for a walk, you can now start. And I'm not meaning an insult to anybody here, but we're now all just chatting. So there is no PowerPoint. Uh, thank you, people, for joining. Um, I'm going to just get you guys to introduce yourselves and I'm going to try and step back from this and let you guys uh, quiz each other on what you're up to and you take the floor. But as everybody knows, if it goes quiet, I will say something. So Stephen, can I first get you to introduce yourself and then you can hand the baton on to somebody else? Yeah, of course. I won't spend too long giving my intro, but uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, the work that we've done to date will, will come out in the discussion. But I'm a principal transport planner at Midlands Connect. Um, I know most people here probably have no idea who Midlands Connect are, seeing as the vast majority of you are, are up in the islands of Scotland, but we're a subnational transport body. Um, essentially what we do is we um, research, develop and progress transport schemes um, with the view of uh, essentially improving um, the economy, uh, social uh, and environmental aspects uh, for, Mid for Midlands residents. Um, we're funded by the Department for Transport um, and Obviously, we we, uh, we sort of look after a wide variety of different transport uh, schemes and projects. But um, I'm personally responsible for our rural mobility work stream, which um, we've done quite a lot of work on over the last few years, identifying the um, almost forgotten rural residents, as I'm sure the vast majority of you will uh, will will uh, agree with. I think um, what what we've recognised is there's a real need to tackle rural issues and challenges um, in our own region. Um, so we, we've done uh, a few projects over the last few years to try and establish what those needs are and try and develop a, a toolkit um, for us to go forward and, and tackle those. Um, and rural hubs um, is one of those key methods for which we think we can solve some of those challenges. Um, so I'll, I'll hand over to the next speaker, whoever that is. I'll, I'll jump in then, Jenny. Well, I. Um... I can't speak quite as fast as you, but I'll have a, have a go. Um, uh, my name is Duncan Bryden. I'm, a, I guess, a community volunteer in the sense of being here um, this afternoon. Um, and for that, I, I, I live in a small village south of Inverness, a little village called, called Tomartin in an area called Strathdurn, which ironically means the, the Strath or the Valley of the Irish. And um, I think we've been at it for a, a while, probably about 400 years um, as, as a mobility hub. You know, it was driving cattle through the place, uh, various armies trotted through. And now the, the A9 trunk road comes through, the Highland Main Line Railway comes through the village, and National Cycle Route 7 all come through the village. And um, I noticed on the poll this question of 
national transport planners not understanding local um, communities. I think trying to get hold of uh, anybody in network rail is 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 an almost an impossible task. Um, so I can uh, relate to that. In our community, we have developed a range of um, features. We've got a, a cafe, a shop, a village hall, a, a multi-use games area, broadband, care schemes, footpaths, cycleways. Uh, and I think the integration of all these is really important with, with the transport element. Um, and uh, the challenge is you're sitting with a village or an area of 650 people. And uh, how do you do a 20-minute neighborhood in, in 650 people spread over an area um, 420 square kilometers? You know, people are scattered. So it's, it's, it's quite a challenge um, putting in all that infrastructure. And I think um, creating hubs where everything happens um, is, is, is really important. So transport is just a means to an end. Transport is getting you from A to B. Um, it, it's what you're actually doing that transport for. So I think we're also looking at trying to encourage people to work from home, um, to reduce the demand for mobility, you know, so that uh, they can buy local foods, they can work locally. Um, and that relates to house design and all that sort of thing. So there's a whole range of sort of opportunities there. Um, and uh, trying to sort of fund it all, keep it all working, and to a certain extent, dealing with a challenge when you become quite successful as a mobility hub, and it puts pressure on, on your core resources, uh, and uh, trying to maintain that over, over the long term, it's quite a nice problem to have, but, but equally it presents sort of local challenges to keep the whole thing going. That's a very quick summary of, of, of where we're at. I'll pass on to, uh, I think Judy was uh, next perhaps. Yep, thanks Duncan. Um, so hello everyone, I'm Jodie Allen. So I'm a transport planner at ADAP, an engineering consult consultancy, uh, and I'm based in our Glasgow office. So, um, but originally you could probably tell from my accent, I'm not from Glasgow. Uh, I'm from a, a small town in Fife within Scotland. So. Um, as well as doing it as part of my job, I've also got personal experience in living in a fairly rural environment grown up and therefore can understand the challenges that that, that brings in relation to travelling. So um, I'm part of our active travel team in Scotland, so we work on projects throughout the country, so within Scotland mainly, but also within England and Northern Ireland, and a lot of those projects are within rural areas as well as being in within a, an urban environment as well. Uh, within the last year, we were commissioned by High Trans and also worked closely with Highland Council uh, to produce active travel master plans for five areas within the Inner Murray Firth region, which is um, the region around Inverness within the Highlands for anyone that's not familiar. Um, and as part of that work, we're also uh, to develop a, a region wide active travel network plan uh, for the full area that would connect all these places together. So that work looked at how we could uh, provide active travel options to connect people and the key services that they would want to get to within these areas. And also look at how to connect the smaller settlements with the larger settlements that they're reliant on uh, for these services. And a key, a key part of that was making sure that we link in with key public transport hubs as well, because um, we, we understand that not everyone's going to cycle up to 10 kilometers between these areas to get to the services they want to get to. So we want to create that full sustainable travel options for them. So connecting into key transport hubs is a key part of the project as well. And a key consideration that we've been looking at within the areas is introducing mobility hubs uh, within specific locations. And that varies in terms of what that would involve or provide uh, based on what those areas need. So it's something I can talk about a bit more I guess as we, we go on but I'll maybe lastly pass to Julie. Thanks Julie. Um, hi everyone uh, my name is Julie Vindis and I work as a project officer at CESTRAN. Uh, CESTRAN is the regional transport partnership for the southeast of Scotland and we represent eight local authorities in the area including the city of Edinburgh um, but also more rural parts of the southeast, um, including five, like Judy mentioned, and Scottish borders and small local authorities like like Manninshire. Um, um, I'm uh, myself as project officer involved in, in a number of projects, which um, mainly focus on reducing um, emissions from transport and promoting low carbon societies. 
Um, so one of the projects I'm involved in is um, funded through the European Union and it's called Share North. And it's all about promoting shared mobility as an option um, uh, for, for low carbon societies. And mobility hubs is one of the, the key um, concepts that the, the project focuses on. And um, in what's involved in this project is a lot of exchange of experience with other European cities and regions um, on uh, uh, policies and pilots um, around mobility hubs and, and shared mobility. Um, so part of this part of this project, we developed a strategic study for mobility hubs for the southeast of Scotland. So looking at how mobility hubs can help improve um, transport connectivity and low carbon uh, transport options and shared mobility options in in the southeast. So looking at each local authority area um, in more detail, where there's a potential demand, but also a potential need. So more from a transport uh, poverty point of view whether that's rural or um, lack of, of access to, to existing services. And um, since we, we published this study last year, uh, we've been working with East Lothian Council to develop one of the first mobility hubs in the southeast of Scotland at the Brunton Hall in, in Musselburgh. So this is more on the, for those not, not familiar with, with um, the area, it's on the periphery of Edinburgh. So it's more of a small, smaller town um, with a lot of people commuting into, into the city. But the concept of mobility hubs is being tested there. And um, we implemented electric vehicle charging for um, the car club there, um, electronic displays for showing bus information, um, mobility hub signage, uh, there's e-bike sharing, as well as uh, the taxi rank and a nearby train station, which also has now has an e-bike sharing hub. Um, and linked to that, and this is a, a bit of work I've, I've been involved in over the last uh, few months, is to develop a mobility as a service slash demand responsive transport project, which we put to um, or submitted to the Mass Investment Fund from Transport Scotland. And we were partly successful in uh, this project bid Sorry, I'm getting distracted by my, my cat who wants some attention. Um, uh, we partly submitted this to, to Transport Scotland. We're, we're partly successful in our, in our bid. Um, so we're now um, we're getting a bit of echo there. Um, we're, we're now uh, submitting a revised proposal to Transport Scotland, which will uh, focus on developing a mass platform which will integrate the, the, the modes of transport at uh, the, the mobility hub in Musselburgh, but we'll also be incorporating a DRT element in there. And maybe that's some, we'll probably touch upon more in the discussion, but what function um, demand responsive transport can have in particularly rural areas to increase the transport offer um, for those that don't have access to a car or would otherwise be forced to own a car, for example, or would otherwise not have a public transport option. And um, so I'll, I'll I'll stop there. And um, Bob, yeah. thank you, thank you. Um, I these guys all have the short straw of knowing me, which is why I've brought the eclectic mix together. But it's eclectic deliberately because I wanted to show that mobility hubs and accessible hubs mean something different to different people and to different organisations, whether you're a transport planner or whether you're a community. And I also wanted to make it possible for people to relate and go do you know what I can go and speak to a Jodie or a Julie or a Stephen or I'm a community and I'm a Duncan and we can make it happen so I'm going to start with Stephen and then just ask you all just to input but how did this all start for you um as on the journey and where do you think this is going to go what's the sort of plan going forward yeah I think I mentioned when I um when I sort of introduced um myself and, and the work we've done um sort of just for background Midlands Connect was sort of set up on the back of um, a need to grow the economy um, sort of focused mainly on economic growth so a lot of our transport schemes were geared up for you know benefit high benefit cost ratios and, and showing the government that we could um, you know get some bang for their book um, but as time went by uh, I mean we as I mentioned earlier we're a partnership of local authorities 23 that is um, I think there was a real demand for looking at a broader spectrum 
So looking at the social implications um, of Midlands residents and looking at uh, the environment more as well. So out of that came a few new strands of work, one being rural mobility, um, another being alternative fuels. So, you know, all looking around decarbonisation as well. Um, but originally the, the piece of work started um, about 2019 and it was essentially just a case of, well, we cover a really broad geography. So um, for, for people here, we, we cover right from the, the Welsh border on the western side of the Midlands, right across to the Lincolnshire coast, uh, as north as Derbyshire and um, also including um, Leicestershire and um, Warwickshire in, in, in the south. So it's a really wide area. Um, and what, what we'd found was that there was a real lack of understanding of um, those wider overarching um, rural issues. So we initiated a piece of work which we called Future of Rural Mobility, which essentially looked to establish those uh, those challenges and develop a toolkit for tackling them. Um, and obviously, we, as I mentioned, we, we found that rural hubs was a, a real, real open goal, so to speak, to really um, start tackling a wide variety of those challenges. Um, and I, I didn't mention this earlier, but what, what we did from that was start to develop a guidance for how to identify where rural hubs could be situated, what kind of services they could look to provide and how far they could go in tackling those, those issues. Um, and on the back of that, we did um, we did some pilots with Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. Uh, Derbyshire has gone far better than what I, what I would have expected. They've um, that they've identified two hubs. They've looked at the kind of um, services that could be provided there. Even gone down to the the sense of looking at the actual um, service providers themselves, so companies that could come in and and provide the services they need. Um, and they've now on the back of that decided to do a whole Derbyshire wide assessment, looking at creating a, a wide network of hubs um, so that's gone really well so we're hoping to continue that momentum so in answer to your question Jenny so there's there's kind of how we got here and now we're looking at taking that a step further and um, as a subnational transport body it's ensuring that what we develop is scalable so I think Julie mentioned something earlier about this sort of um, framework uh, the mass framework and we're kind of hoping to take this concept of a framework um, and try and ensure that okay everyone's going to go off and do their do their hubs so Duncan mentioned his own community hub there might be variety popping up everywhere um, and it's a case of us as a regional body trying to ensure that they um, are efficient in the way that they're procuring services and we can also have a bit of a feedback loop and understanding again what those rural challenges are and how far some of the measures are going to tackling them um, so we see ourselves kind of acting as a, a role to secure funding. I think that's one of the biggies. I think what everyone here will, will testify that, you know, getting funding for, for rural hubs is quite challenging, just doing rural areas as a whole, um, you know, having a business case stack up when you've got limited, uh, a small population, those, those numbers don't add up as easy. So we're pushing government, at looking at new ways of, um, of actually deciding how to provide the funding um, and, and how to uh, look at business cases. Um, so yeah, we're, we're looking to essentially do a regional demonstrator for a rural hub that will then that we can then look to scale across the Midlands um, in the uh, next, hopefully in the next year or so. And I have to say, I'm really grateful because Midlands Connect have done the last couple of years for the gathering. So we've been following the story, so you won't be allowed to escape. Um, on the funding thing, I'll come back to Julie and Jodie for those questions at the moment, but it's quite a nice link to, to Duncan because you funded um, your, your hub, for want of a better description, which in truth, Duncan would tell you he wouldn't think of it as a mobility hub, which so that's absolutely fine by me. But do you want to explain where your funding came from and how you, you came to be as you are? And very good, by the way, if you're going up the A9, stop off and get a coffee and look at the fantastic three bridges that are there. But that's just a personal note. Yeah, yeah. And you can uh, plug into our electric charger as well. Um, <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank, thanks, Jenny. Yeah, funding, um, I mean, we're, we're in the fortunate position, um, unfortunate if you don't like them, um, of having a substantial number of um, wind turbine farms in and around the area on, on the hilltops. That's been a, a, a quite a significant change to the high little landscape. And um, if you happen to be close to some of the major interconnectors connecting the highlands down to the central belt, um, where you can plug in power um, export, you are likely to see quite a lot of these turbines developing and also where you can get clean wind um, 
Um, where you've got pointy mountains, um, wind is, is very erratic, where your, your hills and mountains are much smoother, the wind is much higher quality, and uh, therefore it's favoured by operators. But what that means is that we've got something like 250 megawatts um, of power um, coming into the area from, from wind farms now. You probably don't quite that means, but, but one megawatt supplies about 400 houses, just to give you some idea. So we have one megawatt for every two people in our area, pretty much. So that generates quite a lot of community benefit funding. The deal was that these places were built, um, essentially big industrial complexes on hilltops, and they contributed into the community, just a very small proportion, um, about £5,000 per installed megawatt. And that has created quite a resource in the community. And we felt it was important to invest it for future generations and therefore creating facilities around a hub. Um, and I notice on the chat, people are talking about e-bikes and all this sort of thing. And yes, these, these are, are great and we're, we're doing that. Um, we're actually putting in counters and things to try and get data, which I'll mention later on. But what, what people tend to forget is that, you know, e-bikes, you need a storage place for them. You need insurance for them. You need maintenance for them. You know, it's not just a question of buying some e-bikes and, and, and getting on with it. They're higher, highly desirable things to be stolen at the moment. And uh, there's uh, a large number of um, bike shops around the Highlands have had very expensive bikes taken um, uh, on quite a regular basis. So there's all these factors for, for communities to, uh, to consider. Um, so we're fortunate we've got the money, um, you need a good plan, and we found that the op wind farm operators, um, if you uh, present them with a good plan, they can see low carbon benefits coming out of money that they are generating for the community, they are much more supportive. Um, so putting a funding package in place um, using these has been uh, quite a core part of us developing what I would call, as you say, uh, Jenny, a, a sort of integrated hub of which transport is a part, because as I said before, you know, transport is, is for a purpose. It gets you to work, it gets you to, to, uh, to, to, to pleasure, to enjoyment, to visit friends and family, to shift goods around. Um, not much transport is, is, is it's, not, it's, it's not an end in itself. Um, it, it's actually for delivering a purpose. So you've got to link it into those to make it sustainable, I, I believe, over the long term. And Jody, you're just up the road uh, with some of the work there. Do you want to explain your your part? Yeah, no. Um, so I guess it's worth kind of starting off with, um, I guess what's happened previously before this project. So um, these master plans that we're pulling together are effectively refresh re refreshes off master plans that were done back in 2010, 2011. Um, so the kind of proposals that were within those master plans are very much now out of date and also there's a lot more funding going into active travel and sustainable transport now and there's been a shift in people's thinking as well so what people would desire to have is is different even over the space of the last year and a half so um, we were doing refreshes off the, the five master plans for those areas um, so that's where it kind of started we're, what it's feeding into as well, so um, as I said earlier, um, we're working very closely with Highland Council. Um, so the master plans that we're pulling together will feed into their local development plan that they've got for the region of Inner Murray Firth. Um, so for them, these master plans are really beneficial and it identifies things that they can uh, put applications in for funding in the future or um, as developments, um, there's a lot of future developments proposed within these areas as well or within the surroundings of these areas. So as these developments come forward, they can also ask for contributions from uh, developers as well. So that's where it's all started and that's what these master plans are feeding into. Um, and I guess the master plans themselves, so obviously I spoke about mobility hubs being a key thing that's been identified within them as a, a proposal that's come out that would benefit these areas it's it's very much a, a kind of high level at the moment we're we're still obviously a lot more consultation a lot more feasibility study will need to follow from from these master plans these are almost identifying where are the ideal locations where is it that people congregate where where do people you know, where would be a convenient location that is accessible for for everyone to get to that they can use as almost their base 
uh, their hub and then you know go from there to connect other places so um i did mention that it's you know it depends on what that area needs so the settlements even the five settlements we're looking at are very different in terms of what services they have within them uh, what public transport is available so um the mobility hubs that we're providing or we would propose within these areas all uh, have very different needs and uh, would provide different things so um, they're very much at the, the level just now where we've got high 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 level proposals if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, Julie I'm going to come to you and I'm going to slightly change it slightly because um, I was listening to somebody having a conversation recently on a webinar and they were explaining how 20 minute neighbourhoods were coming about and they were talking about that rather than a mobility hub and I think mobility hub seems to be more of a, a suburban rural idea rather than an urban area and the urban area was more focused on the 20 minute neighbourhoods but they said that they were um, the question I actually put to them was how do you measure what is a 20 minute neighbourhood what's the 20 minutes and they said it's 20 minutes by car and I went, well, not everybody <laughs> in a rural area has a car or has the ability to own a car, as some people here will testify. So how is Seshtrans looking at these mobility hubs and 20 minute neighbourhoods? Please tell me it's not based on car journey times, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised to hear that. I thought the whole concept was about facilities being within 20 minute walk or um bike ride i suppose or um or by bus um at at the most I, I guess but yeah principally by by walking and cycling sort of active travel modes i think so that's that's very much how <laughs> how i understand the concept and i think i think they're they're slightly different in the sense that mobility hubs are um a, almost like a, a tool to help uh, shape 20 minute neighborhoods. So mobility hubs can help um, add to the transport network. And especially when they're situated in, in more rural areas at the sort of end of the public transport network. So at a, a train station, the, la the last train station, or for example, um, Leven in, uh, in Fife, that, that's something that we're, we're currently looking at and we're um, developing a feasibility study and business case for incorporating mobility hubs um, as uh, Cameron Bridge and Leven railway stations are being developed. So that would be the sort of end of the, the train line um, or the, the final stops on, on that line and how can mobility hubs be implemented there so people can reach the train station within an easy bike ride or um, uh, walk, you know, walking distance or shared mobility modes. And um, so it's about providing the, the modes and, and the means for people to, to be able to access their facilities, access these, these services. And I think the way, or where we, to talk a little bit on where we came from, um, which is very much through this Share North project and the experience of working with other European um, partners. So some, some are cities, some are university departments, um, but one of the, uh, the key partners is the city of Bremen and the way they look at um, Mobilpunkte as they're, they're calling them, mo mobility hubs in Bremen is very much from, an, from a city point of view, but um, the, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this is because they're looking at car clubs and car sharing as a key component to reduce um, car dependency or kind of remove the need to own a car um, because it's very much it plays into the sort of behavioral change if, if you have a car that sits right outside your door and you have to walk 200 or 400 meters to the nearest bus stop and pay for that ticket it's it's a barrier for people to use um, to use public transport when they do they do have um, their own private car as well. So mobility hubs can help, and and particularly car clubs, integrated ad mobility hubs can help reduce the need to own your own vehicle, which then means that you're making a more conscious decision about whether you need to you need you need a car. For the particular journey that you're making or whether you can use public transport or a bike and I think that's um, that can really help um, in creating this sort of 20 number 20 minute neighborhood um, 
concept and, and societies that are based around that concept. Yeah. Jenny, got Jenny can I, can I come in on, on, on some of these points? I mean, uh, it's quite good having uh, three um, transport planners to have a go at. <laughs> um, the, the, the whole idea of, of you know, um, at a, a strategic level, speeding up traffic between cities, and if you happen to be a rural community in between these two big cities, it's quite difficult to break into, you know, trunk roads, railway lines, national bus networks, all these sorts of things. But the point as well in rural areas, certainly the, the, the view that I've seen is that, you know, the, the more rural they are, the more clapped out your buses that you get shunted out from the, the urban areas, um, the more unreliable they are, the more unsuited they are to, to, to small roads. There's a high cost. All the surveys I've done with young people is that they're very keen on public transport until they're old enough to drive, and then they buy a sort of um, souped-up Corsa or whatever you know and tear around, um, and and you'll never see them again on public transport um, in, in in a rural area. Um, so so the quality and the equity is is quite a big issue, and and certainly around Inverness, um, the the settlements it seems very different. If you're north of Inverness you can get to the cinema because there's a bus that takes you home at, at 11 o'clock at night. South of Inverness, there's no bus. It stops at, at five o'clock. You can't even go to the college and back, um, you know, for uh, you know afternoon um, lessons on, on, on the bus. It just doesn't exist. It, it, it seems to me a fundamental inequity there. Um, now, I, I realise that, that you'll get more, more, more business in, in areas where you've got more people, but there needs to be a base level of service, a base level of quality of infrastructure um, that people should, should expect in, in these areas. And, and, and I think transport planners really need to focus on that um, a, a, as much as they can and work out how we can you know, stop the, 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 the train from, from Edinburgh to, to Inverness at, at to Martin Station, which is 17 miles south of Inverness, because it just tears through and if you want to get the train, you've got to go all the way to Inverness and then all the way back again. And, and the same with the buses, the intercity buses, exactly the same. Um, it, the, the, there's no intermediate stops. Um, it's, it's so, funny. It, You're talking about the practical side of things, which is Jenny Milne, I like being practical, which sometimes often gets missed. And I'm trying to just look at the chat here because I'm conscious of time. And you've mentioned data. We've also got accessibility questions here. Somebody said we need an actual definition from Scottish government as to what 20 minute neighbourhoods actually means. Quite a lot of chat about um, wind, which um, I'll let you deal with later on, Duncan, um, but also highlighting that bikes aren't the main um, the main solution because not everybody can use a bike and that comes into the accessibility and I know we've got this session on accessibility later on but if it just literally we've only got five or six minutes left if you could all just briefly sort of say how accessibility has come up in your projects and what how it's being addressed and looking at the role of data and what was the other question that I haven't managed to cover off that was there um, I've got somebody correcting you, uh, Duncan, or adding to you, no buses northwest of Inverness in the evening either. Uh, that came <laughs> yeah. from, um, so, so basically, if you live north of Inverness, you're all right. Um, and Andy uh, also saying, and I know one or two of you, the answer to this is yes, is anybody thinking about mobility hubs hosting workspaces for those working from home that may need access to fast networks and office facilities? or just to take a break from home working. Yes, we're all in that boat, which is why I suggest you can go for a walk while listening to us um, without having to travel to a city. So three three things, working uh, data and accessibility. If you can just, four of you rattle through those each. Uh, Julie, I'll start with you. Oh, um, I was just just thinking about the, the accessibility one and the, the, the one that, or the, the points I wanted to make was about demand, well, and, and about the bikes, I suppose. And it's true that cycling is not not for everyone. Um, but I think it's, the, yeah, I want, I want to say that it, it part part of it is a cultural cultural thing. Um, being uh, from the as as a Dutch, um, as a, coming from the Netherlands originally, uh, I know it's as a cultural difference. Um, but that's not to say that not everyone uh, can use a bike and that's that's fair enough. So from an accessibility point of view, I think that's why mobility hubs are key because they offer the range or they're about offering a range of services. So um, meeting everyone's needs um, on a particular day or for a certain type of journey or a particular, a certain user. 
Um, and that's where I think uh, mobility hubs are about offering a range, a range of services, um, because it's also true that not everyone can drive, for instance. So also in rural areas, um, I think from an accessibility point of view, demand responsive transport can, for example, be a solution to people that for, for whom cycling or driving a car uh, is, is not an option. Um, so that's what I, I wanted to say, say about that. But. Right, I'll hand over to Stephen. Do you want to go yeah. accessibility data or workspace? Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think data plays a really important role here. I mean, in terms of understanding what level of accessibility is required as well. I mean, I've kept my eye on the chat. I definitely, I mean, I think this is the point, isn't it? I think, you know, promoting um, sustainable travel is really important. But what we found in our research and our data is that, you know, you're looking at aging populations in rural areas um, and I think, you know, the distances that, that rural residents, at least in the Midlands, have to travel to get to work, you know, often can't be picked up by bus routes either. Um, so there's almost a, a point of making sure that we tailor the services based on what that specific rural hub needs. Um, and that, obviously that's where data is crucial. And we're talking here at Midlands Connect about um, the possibility of developing a, um, a sort of a data framework, a blueprint, if you like, for future hubs to follow that will allow us to accumulate the data and um, also then advise government better in terms of how to um, how to target funding. Um, I think just on one of Duncan's points as well, you know, us as transport planners, I think what we're trying to do is, is change the system as well, is look at, you know, how um, rural business cases can be viewed differently to typical business cases. I mean, we're stuck in the realms of you know, let's look at benefit cost ratios, etc. When really we need to be looking at the social importance. Um, you know, in rural areas, it's it's needed most. Um, so yeah, just that was just on Duncan's point. We're not we're not um, we're not against rural areas. I think the point is that we're we're trying to we have a game. We've got the framework in place, and we're just trying to change that to make sure that it's inclusive for everyone. I think that's. And I know you haven't mentioned it, but you are looking at uh, workspaces and stuff within their solutions. You just need to nod, don't you? Because I know you are. And yeah, that's, that, that's the that's what the toolkit does, uh, Jenny. Uh, the toolkit yep. has a series of um, of possible methods that we can tackle those rural issues and looking at um, identifying workspaces where where people can come and um, collaborate better as well. You know, it's, it's cross-sectoral collaboration as well that you facilitate in there, people within different industries facilitating conversations that would have never taken place in the city. Um, but yeah, work, workspace is definitely included in part of our work at least. Jodie, two minutes data yep. accessibility and workplace if you can please yeah i'll add on to what stephen was saying about data there so one thing we find as a, a major challenge within our projects is the level of data that's available uh, to understand currently how many people might be cycling or walking or, or what types of public transport they're using or to even understand how people would perceive things like mobility hubs because things like that haven't been put in these areas yet so we don't have anything like that at all so one thing that's always really important for us in projects is getting the local communities involved from the beginning, so right from the start of the project. So I think it's really important to, to kind of fully understand what it is a community needs. Um, and for example, what would benefit them most within a mobility hub? So we've talked already that kind of not one size fits all. There might be, uh, you know, different needs within each community that, that you know, therefore mobility hubs will completely change depending on what area you're looking at um, but getting people involved um, from identifying groups or individuals um, who could potentially even take these projects forward in the future as they progress because um, you want the community support there and you obviously need resource and people on the ground that can can have it functioning on a daily basis as well so um, in our projects we've um, made sure to try and make it as engaging as possible obviously with COVID it's been made a little bit harder um, but we have done walkabouts using Teams and Google Street View and tried to get community groups and things along on that as well just to to really understand the area so that we're putting the right infrastructure on the ground so I'll stop there because it's probably close to two minutes. <laughs> okay Duncan. Three, three top tips Jenny you asked us for grab data that's already been talked about we've installed bike counters so we know how many passes there are um, data is a very powerful tool to lever out funding and uh, to convince the public sector that uh, that you need their support. 
embrace integration is the second point. Um, so you can have coffee and cake, which I know you like, Jenny, when you're waiting for your bus or you're charging your car or your bike um, on the on the EV charger. And finally, accommodate unpredictability. You know, we never saw COVID coming, but as a result, many more people are walking and cycling. I know people, not everybody is cycling, but it's made people think differently. It's been a pain, but it's also precipitates change, which is a good thing. Yes, I would agree with you. And you know what, just as a result of this conversation, Alex might swear at me, but we had two locations down for uh, the poll for uh, the gathering next year. But I'm sitting here thinking, maybe we should be going to Tomatum <laughs> for, the, for the gathering next year. And we can see how good or bad the public transport is or how accessible it is and just try it. So maybe, maybe Duncan, you never know. Alex, bung it into the poll and let's see. Um, maybe people are now avidly Googling to see where Tomatum actually yeah, well, is. We're running out of car parking space at the moment. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. I have to thank you all very much for, for doing this. And I'm sure you're going to be back next year in person to actually tell us, Judy, what's going on in, in, with you Absolutely. and also for Julie, what's happened. And Stephen, what's the next next chapter going to look like? And actually get to meet you in person. That might be really exciting. I'm smaller than you probably think, but hey ho. And Duncan gets to see me on a regular basis, so he won't get away. But I really thank everybody for the questions in the chat. Um, I know we haven't managed to get through everything and there's a lot of detail in there from consultation consultations that close today to opportunities for the MPF4, et cetera, et cetera. So speakers, if you wouldn't mind just spending five minutes later on just going through those and contributing, that'd be really helpful. Um, now, Alex has hinted in the chat that you're going to have a 10 minute uh, break. And if you weren't with us last year, this will be new to you. If you were with us last year, OK, it's coming back to to haunt you. Um, Alex, stop putting polls up and I need to screen share, please stop. Um, we are going to go and do a scavenger hunt okay and if i can get my screen up for you just now then what the scavenger hunt is and uh, i see gerard smiling because he wasn't here last year going what the dickens am i about to do when i put the kettle on these are pictures that we took last year um of things that represented s r i t c okay mine's at the bottom there so yana that was the gin that i was having and it might be a bit familiar to some people and yes those slippers are still on my feet today because i'm still at home i may have brushed my hair for you but i've still got my slippers on um but why are you going to put the kettle on you have those 10 minutes to go and look for something that starts with a C, an O, a P. You can either bring two of something or something that begins with the letter T or S or six. So you've got COP26 and what you're going to do is go around your location, wherever you may be, whether that's in the farmyard or whether that's in your office or in your house, and you're going to bring these back to the desk. And yes, guess what? We have three breaks. But don't worry, if you don't get it all photographed in the first break, you have the ability to do that in the third. It's a bit of fun, gets you moving, gets you put the kettle on, and we will be back at just after 10 past two. So off you go for a quick, quick scavenger hunt and cup of tea, because I'm going to go and get one. 